This posture of moving towards the six-party talks, uh, suggesting Bosworth will just waste his time and he's coming back to repeat what they've already heard. Uh, there is, from my sense, a, a new lease on life in terms of time. That the North Koreans, for whatever motivated them to initiate this process of talking that could lead back to the six-party talks, that in this period when we were visiting, uh, I think they determined we've got a little bit more time that's on our side. Things look pretty good. Uh, maybe some of the humanitarian aid from China is having a positive effect uh, there. I'm not sure, but that's my sense on that. With regard to um, the the peace treaty, and, and you know what what I would expect is what the U.S. has said, what uh, Secretary Clinton has said publicly, is these are discussions that the United States is prepared to have with uh, North Korea. But that's not the reason that Steve Boswell went there, and that's not the purpose, and he's not going to have those discussions. So I think there's going to be a reiteration uh, simply of uh, we agree. We need to have these discussions. But this isn't the time, and this isn't the place, uh, and that it will require us to come back to six-party talks. Now, the question that you ask specifically is, Will the United States have to have comprehensive discussions to bring the North Koreans back? That's not the game plan of the U.S. It's the reverse. It is to reiterate to the North Koreans that comprehensive discussions can take place within the, within the context of six-party talks. Uh, and so I, th my own, you know, you're, we're we're speculating how this is going to play out. It's a question of what the North Koreans want to accept. Are they going to accept at some point in time? This trip, probably not. Is If there's a second trip, will they accept the U.S. saying, we will address these issues in the appropriate forum, with the appropriate partners, meaning South Korea primarily, and the Chinese, uh, but they have to come within the context of the six-party talks. Will the North Koreans accept that, come back to the six-party talks, and then try to have an exclusively, uh, but periodic, exclusive discussion with the United States and periodic pro forma uh, conversations in the six party uh, discussion. We'll wait to see. Uh, I'm going to jump in really yeah. quick. Jack, the um, two U.S. perception trends were brought up in our meetings with Ambassador Lee, and uh, one of them was the growing uh, belief uh, on the American side that North Koreans are never going to give up their nuclear weapons. And the second was this people may actually be getting tired of the going back to the beginning and starting over all of the time. Both of those were raised and received pretty typical responses from, from Ambassador Vigan, but did you notice anything special in their responses, or do you think they're retaining or that's resonating with them and they're changing yeah. anything because of it? Yeah, it's an interesting point, and, and I'm, I'm glad, uh, Nicole, that you brought that out. One of the things, and I didn't go through what we were saying and what we were presenting. But one of the things I did earlier on uh, with Ambassador Lee Gunn is to say, you know, I need to tell you that the, the situation in Washington, that the pre pre predominant view, particularly over the last year or so, is that most serious Korea watchers don't believe that you ever intend to give up your nuclear weapons. That that's the view. Um, and he said, yes, yes, we understand that. And he, and he kind of sloughed it off and he would go back through, uh, you know, peace treaty, can come back, etc. So I, he wasn't surprised. I think that's the reaction. You know, do they understand that? And the answer is, yeah, I think they do. Uh, there. Uh, and the other part was, um, I can't remember if he brought it up. Um, uh, and I think he may have, he indicated, uh, yes, that they had heard uh, President Obama say, you know, we're not going to buy the same horse again. We're, uh, I, he put it in the, I think the context was that he listened to the President probably in Singapore to say we have to break this pattern of uh, buying the same thing, coming back and buying and purchasing uh, the North Korea to come back. So they're very conscious of uh, uh, both the attitudes, uh, these isn't the, these aren't things aren't coming as a surprise. Well, uh, if we have uh, 
just one more thing, Mr. Sir. Right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the focus was on the year of 2012. Right. The year was your plan of the Kingston and the And you said 30th anniversary of the Kingston and the Kingston. Yeah. So did uh, Mr. Regan clear your script? You mentioned the name of the no, uh, they did not. I think, if, if I can use some interpretation here, at the, at the very beginning of this, as uh, as Lindgren talked in terms of the robustness of Kim Jong-il going out, uh, as reported in the international media, he is validating their own beliefs through foreign observations there. Uh, he made no other mention of the succession of that. We didn't, as I say, I had a laundry list of things to talk about, which that was one, we just couldn't get to that. We had a conversation, or at least I had a conversation with a foreign journalist uh, at the Cordio Hotel uh, who indicated, the, let me put this in the right framework, when we were talking to the British, there was a sense on their part that, that there may have been uh, too much, too fast in terms of succession, and that it was being tamped down, if you will. Uh, this foreign journalist separately said, hey, if you go out by the railroad stations between four and five, you can see and hear groups of school children singing the praise of this young leader that's, that's coming up. Uh, so there's some contradiction in observations on that. I think the general impression that a lot of us had, in fact, was that that very rapid movement to, to finding a successor, in fact, is leveled off with the increased visibility and health of, of the current leader. But yet there is still reporting coming out that it's still happening, uh, but not maybe so visible to us. There was a lot of talk of succession and regime and stability with succession, but it was perhaps that's where the sense of humor in, in impressing upon us that they can never be sure with uh, regime change in the United States. And he was very, very concerned about Obama's successor and what will happen then. <laughs> well, uh, let, me, uh, let me just thank you. And I, and I want to, uh, I, I know a lot of you have asked for individual interviews, and I just apologize because, as you can see from the room, I just couldn't do it for two reasons. One, uh, the timing uh, around Thanksgiving. And uh, even though we operate as private citizens, we have our own obligation as citizens to report back to the U.S. government in this case because we have such a strong allied relationship with South Korea. I tell uh, obliged is my first obligation is to inform uh, uh, the South Korean government right after I talk to the U.S. Embassy. So all those things in combination, and quite frankly, uh, I, what I didn't want to do was to do something uh, too much in advance of uh, Ambassador Bosworth's trip. You know, this really is on uh, what he, the U.S. government, and the Allies are doing. It's not what we're doing, so we're just trying to demystify what we did uh, here and hopefully uh, answer some of your questions and throw in a, a couple sentences on our own analysis. But thanks very much for coming. And uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to remind you that uh, on Wednesday next week, the 16th, uh, 6.30 to 9 p.m., we'll be having a Korea Club meeting, also featuring Ambassador Pritchard as keynote speaker, the top of that program, his recent visit to Pyongyang, 